We're in this good news series because we can all really use some good news. Why do we need good news? Because every day it seems like we're confronted with bad news. And we just look at the news and all over the news we see disease, uh, destruction, disasters, death. And our world is reeling in pain right now. Many of us are in pain too. And, and what do we do individually? What do we do collectively when we're in pain? Well, we try to numb the pain. That's like our solution. We just numb it. We smoke something to disengage. We drink something to take the edge off. Maybe we just scroll endlessly to take our mind off it or watch yet another episode. Whatever it is, we, we try to numb the pain because we're trying to figure out how do we navigate this broken world that we live in. And I just want to tell you, we don't have to, to just numb the pain. There's a better way. Uh, we don't have to, to wallow. We actually can win. We don't just have to stick it out. We can pull through. And Paul, in what he says next to his letter to the Romans, offers us that very hope and the how-to in what he says next. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, where we're going to see this hope that we have. Now, if you need a Bible, you can grab one for free from the back table, or you can just follow along in our free church app where you can jot down some notes as well. Now, what you may remember from our time together last time, in Romans 7, Paul very plainly, very authentically shared about the struggle, the very real struggle that we all face with sin. You see, while we're, we're saved by Jesus from our sin, we still struggle with sin at times. And our transformation to become like Jesus takes time. It seems like it takes a lot of time. And Paul talks about this, how we, you know, we know what we should do, but we don't do it. We know what we want to do, and yet we still don't do it. And at times, what we'll do is we just try harder and harder. But really, we're not making a whole lot of progress. It's as if we're like on a hamster wheel, just going around and around and around. I guess the, the human equivalent might be a treadmill. Okay? Just to go on the record, I think that is a cruel and unusual form of punishment, if you ask me. It's a whole lot of effort. Running, running harder, running faster, and you're going nowhere. But... We do it. We pay for it. We pay to use them. And uh, I digress. Th th this vacillating between wanting to do what's right and yet finding ourselves doing the opposite is challenging. And Paul spoke very plainly to that last time. And coming right out of that, that talking point, Paul has to say this about the hope that we have and the transformation that we can experience. But before we read what he wrote, let's do this. Let's pause, let's pray, and let's ask God to speak to us in this moment. Lord, we come before you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks plainly about our experience in life and that you offer us hope. Thank you, Jesus, for being our hope. Would uh, you just reveal yourself to us in a fresh way today? Whether we're exploring faith in you or we've been following you for decades, would you help us to know you more? Would you be our hope and our help? And Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. So Paul reminds us of the gospel, the good news, in what he says next, now in Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, condemnation's a word you probably don't use often. Condemnation refers to the penalty for our sin, which what we've seen earlier in Romans is death, eternal separation from God. That is the ultimate result of our sin. But he says this, right? Again, in verse one, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What Paul is saying is we were victims we were held captive, we were in bondage to our sin, 
and we couldn't save ourselves. We were powerless to do so. And the law, the, the Hebrew scriptures, it outlined what it looked like to live in a right relationship with God. And it, in so doing, what it also did was reveal to us, and to Paul's original audience, there's no amount of effort, there's no amount of trying, there's no amount of religious duty, boxes that can be checked. There's no amount of effort that can get us back to God. Left to our own devices, we're victims to our sin. But while we were stuck in our sin, God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to take on our sin so that we could walk free. No longer do we have to be held back by that sin. No longer do we have to be held captive or in bondage. No, no, we get new life. And now, through Jesus, we're not condemned. We're actually connected with God. We can have a relationship with him again. What we couldn't do ourselves, Jesus did for us, did for me, he did for you. In Christ, there's no condemnation because in Christ, we get to live. And what does this mean? Well, Paul says, you know, do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And that sounds good. Sounds like a church thing to say, but what does he mean? What does that mean for your life and my life? Well, let's keep reading to find out. Picking up in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Okay, before we move on, I gotta, I'm just going to break down what is Paul you know, contrasting here. Well, on one hand, there are some of us who are st we're stuck in our sin. We haven't received Jesus' forgiveness. Uh, you know, whether we are very conscientious of God's way or not, we've all chosen to go our way. And unfortunately, when we go our way, it leads to death. Because we're, we're sinful, we're unrighteous, we fall short. But then on the other hand, there are those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, who have been obedient to Jesus. We've been baptized, like he, yes, we're followers of him. And for those of us who've received Jesus, Paul says, look, you've got the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. That's, that's also one of the promises of the gospel, that God's very presence dwells in us when we are in a relationship with him. Paul expounds on this in what he says next. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Okay, did, did you catch that? Like the, the very spirit of God, the power, the presence of God is living in us if we are followers of Jesus. Not only this, but the Holy Spirit gives us a new identity. No longer are we victims in Christ, we have something completely new, something so much better, because no longer are we held back by our sin. We're going to keep reading to find out what this new identity is. Therefore, like in light of this gospel, in light of the Holy Spirit living in us, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. 
This is our new identity. No longer are we slaves. We are children of God. We move from slaves to sons and daughters. We, uh, our identity, our value, our worth, it's not anchored in what we do. It's anchored in whose we are. We are His. And this makes me think of one of the last things that I'll say to our girls when I put them down and I. We have three girls. Abigail is three months, Chloe is two, Hannah is four and a half. And when we put the girls down for bed, the older two, we will kind of go through their day. And their days are filled with plenty of highs and lows, moments of obedience and disobedience, the whole deal. And we'll talk through their day, and then I'm, I'm very intentional about one of the last things I say to them when, I, right before I turn off the light and say goodnight. And I'll, I'll grab them close and I'll say, Hannah, Chloe, Abigail, I love you, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. You are mine. And I say that very, very intentionally every single night. Because in a world where our value is measured by performance, I want my girls to know that it's not their performance, their obedience, or lack thereof, that impacts my love for them. Oh no, they're loved because of their position. They are my daughters and I love them. And even more than what I say to them, I pray that that will help them understand the Heavenly Father's love for them one day. Because truth be told, that's how God feels about all of us. It's not what we do that earns his love, his affection, our value, our worth. No, we are loved because he chooses to love us. We're valued because of whose we are. We're, we're God's children, which means we're loved. And Paul says we're co-heirs with Christ. Okay, that sounds awesome, but what does that mean? Co-heirs with Christ in all honesty, that could be an entire message in and of itself. But I'm just going to give you three quick things that it means. The first is that as heirs, we're going to receive an inheritance. Heirs, they just receive inheritance. That's kind of that comes with the territory. And we will receive an inheritance from God one day. Second, co-heirs means we're going to share in the same privileges as Christ. Okay? Not least of which being a relationship with the Father, which Paul is definitely talking about here. And then third thing, this idea of being co-heirs with Christ, well, given what Paul is talking about, how we share in Christ's sufferings and then also one day his future glory, it seems to me like we are going to fully understand, fully realize what it means to be co-heirs one day in the future. It's fun to dream about it now. It's fun to await it with some expectancy, with some hope, but we're never going to fully understand what that looks like until we actually get to experience it one day, and it's going to be a great day. But it, when you look around at life now, it doesn't always feel like we're a co-heir with Christ. Because we live in a broken world. It's plagued by sin. And Paul addressed this very real problem that we all feel, that we see in the news. He addressed it next. Now verses 18 through 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. As we've been a victim to sin, sin has impacted our lives in more ways than we care to admit, so too creation has been a victim to sin. This is why we see disease, natural disasters, 
other forms of destruction. It's like creation is, is groaning. It's struggling right now. Because when sin entered in, it messed up God's perfect creation. When God created, he saw that it was good. It was very good. But sin has marred it. We've had a part to play in that. But even in our groaning, we have this anticipatory waiting. Just like creation is waiting for the day where it's going to experience restoration, we are awaiting the day where we're going to experience restoration and redemption as well. You see, victims are hopeless because they're helpless. But we, we are hopeful because we have the help of the Holy Spirit. While we wait for this full, this complete restoration one day, we don't do it uh, flippantly or carelessly. We do it with an expectancy because even in the waiting, we have God's presence with us, in us, guiding us, strengthening us. So while we wait for this redemption, this restoration, we do so with hope and we do so with faith. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, faith, faith is the confidence in what we hope for in assurance about what we do not see. Interestingly, if we look for hope in the news, we're going to find ourselves rather hopeless because you know what gets the clicks? Fear gets the clicks. So if you want to make a lot of money or get a lot of followers, stir, up, stir the pot, get some fear going, help people feel that, and they're going to click on whatever the thing is. Or that's, that's the whole like, way things work these days. Fear gets the clicks. But when you look at a bunch of fearful news headlines, it doesn't inspire hope, does it? Our hope is not in a headline. Our hope is in a person, Jesus. Our hope rose from the grave. Our hope is coming back, and when our hope comes back, there is gonna be no more mourning, or death, or crying, or pain, or suffering. All that stuff will be long gone because Jesus is making everything new. He's making us new. He's gonna renew his creation. And as we wait, we wait patiently, not hopeless because we're not victims. We're not helpless. We have hope. Our hope has a name. Listen to how Paul continues, verses 26 and 27, about how the Spirit intercedes for us when we're weak, when we don't even know what to pray for. Listen to this, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. While we wait, we wait hopefully, and we do so with the help of the Holy Spirit to navigate whatever we're facing. When we don't even know what to pray for, the Spirit will intercede for us. It'll, he'll step in. And, and help us pray when we don't know what to say. We're never helpless because we have the very power and presence of God in us, in you. Now, there are days when we're weak. There are days when we want to throw in the towel. We want to call it quits. We just want to throw our hands up. We're done. And, and honestly, the day that I woke up to write this very message, uh, you could say I woke up on the wrong side of the bed because I totally was playing the victim card. I'm tired. Hannah woke me up. I am going to be late. I have to get bring her to preschool. I've been preaching the gospel for weeks. I don't know if it's landing. I don't want to write this message. I was like a pro at playing the victim that morning until I wanted to be a good husband, a good dad, a good pastor. And it was then when I asked the Holy Spirit to be strong. Because scripture promises that when we're weak, he is strong. Listen to this. Paul wrote this elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 12. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly 
about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sure, we're weak, but we're never helpless because we are never powerless. We have the power of God living in us, enabling us to do whatever is before us, to to weather whatever the storm is. Uh, Last week, I was meeting with a church planning director in the area, and I was talking to him about how how can we better equip church planners as they head into this, this process. And we were just in conversation about something and not even knowing what we were talking about last week at service or today, he said something that I can testify is true for every church planner, but it is also true for every one of us. And he said this, when dependency is the objective, then weakness is our advantage. When dependency is the objective, then weakness is our advantage. Because there are times when we don't know what to do. When you don't know what to pray for. When you're weak. And it's then that his grace is sufficient for you. Because his power is made perfect in your weakness. It's then when his power can be on display. His strength can be seen by others. In Christ, we're never helpless. In Christ, we're never hopeless. And and Paul described it this way in verses 28 through 30, back in Romans 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Friends, No matter what has happened to us, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going to encounter, we have hope. As followers of Jesus, we have hope. Because God's purpose will prevail even in the midst of our pain. So our pain isn't pointless. God redeems even our pain, even the struggle, even the suffering to bring about something good. For us and others, ultimately for his glory. Sometimes the the, the pain we feel, uh, it can be self-inflicted. Sometimes the pain we feel is inflicted on us by others. Sometimes it's just because we live in this broken world that's still marred by sin and things still go wrong and people are still hurt as a result. And I wish we could just like get rid of pain. That would be awesome. And one day it will happen But right now, here in the midst of a world where there is pain, where you and I feel pain, what I love about God is that he can take what's broken and he can make it beautiful. Uh, You know, maybe we face a closed door and then we'll see God open another door. Uh, Maybe uh, a loved one passes, but God moves in the situation and someone else comes to know Jesus, has life in Jesus as a result. Maybe you receive the diagnosis and he uses that as a season to grow your dependence in him. When we're suffering, when we're in pain, we can have hope because God gets it. Jesus gets it. I mean, listen to this back in Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter four. Says this, therefore, since we have a great high priest, talking about Jesus, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When it comes to our pain, uh, What I love about Jesus is that he gets it because he's felt it. He gets us. So let's be a people who, when we face pain, when we face struggle and suffering, let's run to him because his grace is sufficient for us in our time of need. 
And we know that as dark as the night may be, because there are some pretty dark nights as we live our lives, as dark as the night may be, joy comes in the morning. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Now, this, mess, this passage is packed with hope for the hurting. Uh, it's packed with help for us all. But I wish I had more time to unpack it. I'm just going to have to leave it for your community group's discussion this week. But I do want to share with you one last hope-filled reminder because this is how Paul concluded. I mean, listen to this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor the height or depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God expressed to us through our Savior, through Jesus our Lord, because in Christ we're not condemned. In Christ, we're connected with God. In Christ, we're children of God. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. Which means, no longer are we victims. In Christ, we're victors. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you that you give us victory. That as hard, as challenging, as the news, as the situation, the circumstance, maybe no matter how hard it is, we know that, that you can pull us through, that you will empower us by your spirit to put one foot in front of the other. You, you give us your, your church, your community to support us, to encourage us, and we thank you for that. And we ultimately thank you for the life and the hope that we have in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. We hope that the message encouraged your faith. If it did, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend to encourage them too. My name's Chris. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Connect Church, where we believe that life with Jesus and life with others is best. That's why we exist as a church to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. And we do that in a couple of ways. First is help you connect with Jesus through our weekly services. Second, connect with people through joining a community group where you can make some friends and grow in your faith. And third, connect people with Jesus by serving and sharing your story with others. I hope to see you at a worship service soon. And in the meantime, be sure to download our free church app by searching Connect Church Community in your phone's app store. The app is the best way to stay up on everything that's going on around Connect. Let us know how we can help you get connected by filling out a Connect card, find a group, and even give to help see this mission and ministry advance so that more lives can be touched with the good news of Jesus. You can connect with God, community, and your purpose, and we're here to help. See you soon.